In this video, we're going to be defining confidence interval and why they're so important to sample size calculations. Confidence interval is the backbone for statistical thinking and understanding how they're calculated will make other statistical concepts easier to grasp. So in my latest video, we defined that X bar or the sample mean is not the same as mu or the population mean or true mean. We also defined that the sample standard deviation is not equal to the population standard deviation. We then went on to define that we have to calculate some kind of band that we call the confidence interval, wherein we are somewhat certain that the true value lies. So as you might imagine, we would like to have these confidence intervals to be as narrow as possible because the more narrow these are, the better our estimation will be. So if our estimations are not equal to our true values, what are they then good for? Well, not much really, but you can think of them as the most likely estimate to your true values. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you get an estimate for, for a mean, x bar, that would be the most likely fallout for your sample. But if you imagine taking an infinite amount of samples, you will have samples that are varying from lower or higher than your estimate. So sometimes your sample mean will, will be over here. Sometimes your sample mean will be over there. And within this range is our true mean then. So because we cannot take an infinite amount of samples, we need to define some kind of area where we know that our true mean can fall within, but we are ex willing to accept the risk that it's not there. So normally that would say, well, there's 2.5% chance of the mean value to be more extreme than this. And we accept that there's 2.5% chance that the mean value is, is more extreme than this. Summing up these values will give us the alpha risk which normally equals 5%. The alpha risk can be something else than 5%. The important part is to understand that if we accept an alpha risk of 5%, we are then 95% confident that the true mean will lie somewhere in between these two values. And we're saying that 5% of, of the times our true mean will be more extreme than our confidence interval. Let's look at a more practical example. Let's imagine that we look at a manufacturing process and we've taken out a sample with a sample size of 20 and we need to make an estimation of the mean to see whether the process is with its spec. So looking at the distribution of our manufacturing process, we can now see that we get a mean of 21.7. But we know that that is not, that is our sample mean, they are not equal to the population mean. So we calculate a confidence interval where the upper 95% confidence interval would be 23.5 and the lower confidence interval is 19.9. Because this is a 5% confidence interval, we then know that there's a 2.5% chance that the actual mean is more extreme than this or this. To give you an even deeper understanding of this, what I've done is that I've simulated making this particular sample 10,000 times or 10,001, one row one being the original sample. So you can see each of these samples are taken with a sample size of 20 and you see this simulation ID then runs up to 10,000. And for each of these simulations, I get the mean and their lower and upper confidence interval. So what we can now do is we can look at a distribution of the mean of our simulated responses. And you can see that I have a very nice normal distribution in comparison to what I had before. What I want you to notice now is how my estimations in my sample relates to the quantiles in my simulated samples. And now you can see that my mean value is pretty much the same as the median value which would be the most common estimation. And you can see that our upper 95% confidence is equal to 97.5, which is 
which means that there's these are the two and a half percent that are more extreme than the upper confidence limit. And the lower 95% mean is equal to the 2.5% down here, meaning that there's 2.5% chance that it's more extreme than this. Now here's the equation for the confidence interval around a mean. And it's important to look at this equation because it will help us understand what kind of tools we have to narrow our interval. And we can see we have really three things here. We have the student t-test number, we have the sample standard deviation, and we have the sample size. So the student number is dependent on alpha and n as the sample size. We have the standard deviation that we can alter, and we have the sample size that we can alter. Now, it's often actually pretty difficult to alter the standard deviation of a process. It's normally just what it is, but we can discuss making alterations to the alpha level, um, but again, that might not be possible. So really all we have to deal with is this S, is this N down here. And to show you how radical it is to actually change this N, I've written out a table for you. But what kind of number is this student t-test? I've made this table so though, that you can get a better understanding of this. So let's imagine that you take a sample of two with a sample size of two. That means that you have one degree of freedom. And that would mean that you're if you have an alpha at 5%, that your student T number would be 12.7. And so what that means is that you would have to put in 12 here and multiply that with your standard deviation as of uh, and the square root of n. So that would really pump up the confidence interval. Um, but imagine you took just seven. Well, that number went from 12 to two and giving you a much broader confidence interval. So if you look at a graph at the student t-test as a function of the amount of degrees of freedom we have, you can see that it really flattens out around seven. And what that means is that if you're only interested in estimating the mean value, you won't really gain much more by taking more than a sample size of seven in this case. That is going to wrap it up for this video. I am going to be referring to this video a lot because many of the concepts that I explained here are the same when we're calculating confidence limits for other things such as cap capability indices or standard deviations. And again, that is very important to understand when we then talk about things sample size because you saw how that student t-test related to our sample size number. So much more on this later, I hope. I didn't want too technical on you, uh, but thank you for watching. Remember to give it a like if you liked it and subscribe if you want more content like this. See you in the next one. Bye.